Hello? Okay, it's almost nine. We good? Check one, two, hello. Mm. Is it on? It's on. It's on and we have power. Can you hear me? There we go. I can hear myself. Great. Hello, my name is Trent. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about aerial photography and FPV drone racing. I work for a company called Unique. Well, let's move into the slide. Who am I? I have eight years of experience in the creative space doing uh, filmmaking for different organizations, uh, whether it be marketing or uh, promotional videos or whatnot. Um, Specifically in drones, I've been supporting, selling, manufacturing, uh, and developing different drone systems for the last three, almost four years now. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. I started out as a user, so I was actually someone who was using a drone in a capacity that I needed it to do something. And through that experience, I'm able to now work for companies that need people who know how drones are used. Uh, and now I'm a product manager at a company called Unique Electric Aviation. Uh, we make drones, we make electric manned aircraft, um, and it's a lot of fun. What I want to talk to you about first today is the Typhoon H with Intel RealSense technology. One of the things in drones right now that is a big hurdle is obstacle avoidance. A lot of people are flying drones for the first time and you know, with depth perception, with um, different challenges to learn how to fly, we're really thinking about the end user and how to make them fly more safe. So the Intel RealSense, using the Intel RealSense technology, the drone is able to know where it is in its environment. It uses two optical cameras to sense depth, and it has an infrared sensor as well that maps the world in real time and builds a 3D map of the environment in the drone. So as you're flying around, the drone is going to remember where obstacles are, and it will not hit those obstacles. That's the bar right there. And Intel has invested $60 million into Unique Electric Aviation, and we have partnered with them to get their technology onto our drones. So to show you how the Intel RealSense works, we can watch this video.
So in that video demonstration, what you saw was a follow me feature. What that means is someone has a tracking beacon uh, on their person and what that does is it sends the GPS signal to the drone so the drone is always aware of where the person is in the environment. What you also saw was the intelligent uh, flight mapping. So the drone will look at the environment and it will make a decision and it will say, do I go over, do I go around, or do I go under? And it will determine the safest flight path to get to where the person who has the beacon is. So the Intel RealSense is a really awesome piece of technology that we have used um, our partnership with them, with Intel, to really make drones safe. But with aerial photography, the thing that people really don't remember is that the drone is no different from a camera. It is essentially a flying tripod. And people get so excited about drone, drone, drone that they forget about the camera and the photography and the composition. And so this is something that I really like to tell people. And to me, it's kind of sad. We're, 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 we're to about the third year of the drone industry. And to me, Aerial, the novelty of aerial photography, it's kind of gone. You need to be telling stories. You need to be engaging your audience. Just having a picture or a video in the air isn't a novelty anymore. Like, it's just the truth. Um, using the drones, we're able to capture amazing panorama shots like this. So what these images are is a series of four to 12 images um, that I stitch together. So you go from left to right, take a series of images, stitch those together, and it gives you much more printing capacity. You can print bigger, you get more detail, and I just like the aspect ratio of the pictures a lot more. So aerial photography is really fun, and I put together a little video to show you guys what it's like to actually put together one of these panoramas. This video shows a vertical panorama. So what this means is, instead of going from left to right, we're actually going straight forward to straight down, which gives you a really unique perspective that you really can't get with any other form of photography. So you can see in Photoshop doing corrections to the stitch. And editing is really, to me, where the fun comes in. So the photography is awesome. And working in the industry and seeing the different things that these drones are used for, it's really, really inspiring. And I just want to be able to show people that this is what you can do with these awesome, awesome machines. So here's a little bit on FPV, a little bit of typo, oops. Um, FPV is really fun. A couple people have touched on it today. You've seen drone racing behind us. And um, what that is, is it's called first person view. So you're wearing goggles. You see what the drone sees live in real time. And it's a really exhilarating experience. I'm someone who has had a lot of out of body experiences in my life. And flying FPV is actually the most direct way to get those experiences. Uh, when you want them on, on demand. Um, so just 11 months ago, the first drone race happened in Sacramento. It's called the Drone Nationals. Uh, a lot of pilots came out. And uh, I was lucky enough, and a couple other people who are here, to have a film crew come out and really show what it was like to be at the first drone race. So this will cover the drone race. This also covers a company called Drone Dudes that I used to work for, a production house out of Los Angeles. Drones are big business, worth billions. And these guys are among those cashing in. That's downtown. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Pan around. Meet the Drone Dudes, a group of filmmakers that specialize in aerial photography. They shoot commercials like this one for Converse. Turn the world upside down. 
and music videos for bands like Coldplay. Pretty much all the rigs you see here are like Frankenstein rigs. We've taken models and hacked them up, and so it's kind of turned into a hodgepodge camera rig that just seems to work excellently. The system actually follows what it is that you're doing with the controller. Oh, that's cool. You want to give it a try? Yeah. Hold it by these blue handles here. Okay. But I think the only way we can see if it really, really works is if you, can you dance for us? <laughs> so if this was flying, I'd be able to feel like I was up in the air as well. Yeah, really get that feeling oh, of flight. This is so fun. In the last decade, these machines have moved beyond the battlefield to chop shops like this one, where filmmakers and hobbyists, emboldened by quickly evolving technology and cheaper prices, are using them to get shots that were nearly impossible a few years ago. And you'll see something in a sec. Trent Sigurd is 21 and the youngest drone dude. Oh yeah. He's been tinkering with these little robots for years. He builds them. This is the 3D printed version. He printed it out with a 3D printer and assembled it himself. He breaks them. Holy Today, he's showing us how he flies the hell out of them. <laughs> this is some footage oh, wow. that uh, we, I was out filming yesterday, kind of dive bombing some cliffs, doing some flips, and it's almost as if the world turns into your video game. I'm reliving this in first person view, or FPV, feeling every flip, spin, and smash Trent made the day before. Wow, this is amazing. I'm almost getting dizzy here. This is so strange. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I just crashed. <laughs> Trent's enthusiasm is hardly unique. There's a lifestyle that kind of follows that techie, creative culture. It's more than just a job for us. You know, we live, we breathe this. Year after year, more and more people are buying drones. And as a result, slowly changing the way they, and by extension their audiences, see the world. The folks behind this film and countless other aerial productions have sparked a drone boom that didn't exist a decade ago. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh! That was awesome. It even spawned new genres of sports, including a fight game. Yeah! You know, two drones enter, one drone leaves. Mark and Eli are crazy about drones. These two have been trying to knock each other out of the sky for years. Which one usually wins, or you two? Oh, it's... it's... He's, he's got some clever ideas, and I'm very bombastic in my style. Their excitement was so contagious that they started an aerial sports league so other people could fight their drones, too. We hope to achieve with all of this. World domination. Yeah, absolutely. We're, there's a whole planet to conquer, and we're going to do it, yeah. To help meet demand, they founded Game of Drones, a company that builds battle-ready bots. Since then, their relationship with their flying robots sometimes borders on the abusive. This is our science bag. This is our airframe. You just, you just can't do that with a regular drone. And ours, we literally are doing this all day long. Like this, up and down. I guess I could do it in real shoes. <laughs> what does it feel like when you fly a drone? It's like, you know, it really speaks to that eight-year-old uh, superhero you always wanted to be. And it's your opportunity to be Superman. You're not going to take that up. <laughs> This feels like sort of a historic moment. The first drone national, the first sort of big drone race. 120 of the world's best pilots have come to Sacramento with their custom-made flying hot rods, all competing for $25,000 in cash prizes. Trent from the Drone Dudes drove up from LA to be here. That'd be so sweet to go back to the studio with 25 Gs and have a party with all the dudes. Norman, the pilot from Tijuana, made the trip too. We were going to do our best. <laughs> and he brought along a crew of Mexican pilots, including Angela Jacks, one of only two women competing. It's not just that you have to be a really good pilot, you have yes. to know how to build one of these yes. like this. Yes, you need to know what's behind it, you need to know how to fix it, you need to know how to build it, and you need to know how to figure out what went wrong. The race is about to start. Calling out the first competitors. 
Each pilot must complete five laps if they hope Thank to stay you. in the game. Excellent. All right, pilots, get your visors on. Only the fastest times make the finals. Three, two, one, go. The racers must navigate a winding obstacle course of twists and turns, flying at breakneck speeds of up to 80 miles an hour. They fly by so fast, it's really hard to film these drones. All while dealing with an array of technical glitches. I'm stuck. I can't see anything. Angela crashes and breaks a propeller. Damn it! <laughs> Seconds later, Trent's drone spirals out of control. Norman also crashes, but manages to get back in the air, finishing his five laps. Good job! He's getting better and better. Finally, Trent crosses the finish line. Excellent job. Great race, guys. Woo, that felt good. But his time was not good enough to make the finals. I had the most fun, so it was a really good day. Angela and Norman <laughs> fell short, too, but they're still flying high. I'm hooked. I'm never going to stop doing this. Both shifts that I did today, I finished them. So for me, I'm the winner. <laughs> In the end, it was an Aussie who was crowned the world's first drone racing champion. The sports proved to be a winner, too. Soon after this race, Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross invested a million dollars in a drone racing league. What comes next is uncertain, but that's not stopping people from betting on a future with a sky full of drones. Yeah, we out here flying. When I put on the goggles, I just feel a complete sense of happiness, freedom, when you make turns, when you flip, when you roll, when you crash, it's a great out-of-body experience. I love it. This is like the first baby steps of something huge. Selfie with a drone. Yeah. <laughs> so at that Drone Nationals, I think it was, I, I first of all wasn't going to go uh, until someone pushed me. Um, and at the Drone Nationals, I feel like that was actually a springboard for the sport, not only for the public perception of the sport, but for the pilot's skill level. Uh, to be at a competition and feel the stress of, you know, calming your nerves and not shaking and being in control of your aircraft, um, it was really a challenge for everyone. It was something I feel like everyone was trying to deal with at that event. And I feel like I really didn't start getting good at flying FPV until after I went to the Drone Nationals. So the organized races are fun. It's fun to fly through an environment, but I've been trying to experiment with how are we going to fly with each other in augmented spaces, in virtual spaces, and how do I get to fly with someone while I'm in California with someone in Mexico. So the way that that could be achieved is through augmented reality. These drones have sensors. They've got GPS, barometric pressure sensors, um, compass. So they're self-aware of where they are in the world. What that means is we're going to be able to overlay computer vision courses over our FPV view. And to me, that's really exciting. So through connectivity on the internet, through the drones being self-aware and letting each other know where they are and being able to overlay where your opponents are, we're going to be able to start racing each other across the world. And to give you an example of what that might look like, this is a video from uh, Epson for their Moverio goggles. And what this is providing is uh, aerial highways for airplane pilots. And so using similar technology, we're going to be able to record and overlay computer vision courses that will really take the immersiveness and the you know, more gaming side of things um, of drone racing that will become more prominent as time goes on. So right now we're flying through these, these physical courses. and. It kind of brings up the subject of, well, what's different from flying augmented reality, from flying a simulator? And that's something we still got to think about. Um, but FPV is really fun. Aerial photography is really fun. 
And thank you for letting me share with you guys. I'd love to answer any questions you guys have on FPV, aerial cinematography, Intel RealSense, Typhoon H. Any questions? So um, on this last part, I, I was telling Angela the other day that I just recently made uh, an, an application using Arduino and Unity 3D to create a, a mixed virtual reality, augmented reality um, uh, app. So I was thinking like, oh man, that, that this should be really awesome to so you can put markers in the in the in the race pad so they can actually populate some information. And you mentioned that like, oh man, I was kind of right. Do you have any like? idea where can I start doing that yeah so with augmented reality drone racing courses the thing that excites me is that everyone has a viewing platform in their pocket so your phone has all the same sensors as the drone so to bring spectators into something that isn't visible to the eye because we're augmenting reality um, using the phone you are gonna be able to hold that up and they'll see the drones flying but they'll also be able to see uh, the, the course as well. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. So, um, you can, can you give me your contact? So, uh, I, I can, I want to start doing it, but since I don't have any drones or anything, I can just start uh, experimenting and, and perhaps sending it to you, tell me if, if it's working for you, so I can get any feedback, so I can do something useful for this. <laughs> So, I mean, augmented reality on phones is really exciting, um, you know, and that can go anywhere from educational stuff is really awesome. So maybe if there's national parks out here, you make the, uh, the entrance to this hike, you have people scan that, and then they have someone in an augmented space walking them through the environment, you know, making more, you know, as, as if they're like a guide. Um, you know, we, we all see that augmented reality, it's going to be in a computer chip in our eye. We're going to be able to speak different languages and have text overlay in front of the person. Um, and two, I didn't understand this, uh, the, the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality uh, not until not too long ago. So the virtual reality is uh, it's, it's a com completely uh, made up environment and the augmented reality is actually using the space to overlay information. Another, I mean, another thing I'm thinking of is grocery stores. You know, mapping in what stuff you want and having, you know, arrows going around the store. And yeah, we should talk. Thank you.